Jesus, let me breathe a life that mirrors yours. Possessed by love and justice, a life that opens doors, doors that lead to you, to the world that you're still making. Make your will be done on earth as in heaven. But who am I to do this? What am I but broken? Take me as I am to meet you where you are, to be what I must be. You were buried with him through baptism and raised with him through faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead. Welcome to this service of worship. We're glad that you're with us. We have a few things we want to note for you as we continue in worship. First, what kind of symbol are you? You know, we use a lot of symbols in our life. Signs, rings, phrases, pictures, logos, code words, inside jokes, you name it. And as Christians, we point to many things that represent our faith. The Bible, the cross, baptism, communion, the fish, the dove, again, Lots of options. But in the end, the most important symbol of our faith is us, people of faith. As you walk through the week, what kind of symbol are you? And what kind of symbol have you been? What what should you be? Think about this during the week. Also, in that same vein, we continue... um, we continue being mindful about evangelism and this supreme, supremely important task for us as people of faith and as Christians. And our training in it as a congregation continues in our program of Open Door um, in phases, um, learning how to recover this skill as, as people of faith. And so with these sharing groups that we're encouraging you to form and to practice All you have to do is gather around a common activity and then share something, just one thing that God has done for you during the week or that month or just maybe even in your life. But use your own words, use your own frame and share. That's it. There's no programming, no secret sauce. There's there's no... um, There's no having to look for permission or for waiting or for guidance. Just gather. I mean, fundamentally, evangelism is literally about sharing good news. That's what the word means. So share. And as we do so, as we practice this, we'll then move into the next phases. Now, we also want to remind you that with the results of the congregational meeting and with Mary Jean Covington and Annette Peddlety, along with an elder from the session serving as our nominating committee, Um, for the next class of elders. This preparation, though, is a congregational task. And so as you get ideas about people who might be a part of our leadership, um, be sure and get that person's permission, as well as to pray over them as a choice before submitting their name to the committee. This is a critically important part of the whole process. But thank you for your help. Um, Lastly, we want to make sure that you're that you know about the endowment committee Um, with the unexpected infusion of funds from the recent educational trust that um, that closed and and allocated some of that money to us as a congregation the session has elected to form an endowment committee to steer how those funds might be spent and so the members of this committee are greg massey alice ray and john taylor be looking for guidelines from them soon about how to submit ideas to them. Now, with all of that in mind, let us take a deep breath, silence our devices, and continue in worship.
When we vote, we are electing people to represent us, ideally. But God chose us to represent God. For all our complaints about the job our elected officials may or may not be doing, we must come to terms with the job we've been doing as God's representatives. Let us confess together. God of hope, we have not always been at our best for you. Sometimes we are the ones getting in the way of people seeing you, coming to you, knowing you. Sometimes our choices obscure the fact that you have chosen us. Please, holy God, transform that habit in us. Make us mindful of where you are at work in us and be open about it. Help us judge well our own shortcomings before harping on others. Help us be aware of how to represent your grace, your love, your mercies better than we do. Gratefully, we pray. Amen. Thank you, for, as always, for listening, God. Amen. It's hard to be on brand. I mean, look, just being human is complicated, isn't it? I mean, when we want someone to be nicer or compassionate, we might say, find your humanity. But if someone makes a mistake, big or small, we might say, they're only human. Well, which is it? Well, as we all know, it's all of it because we're complicated. And it's the problem that we really have with labels, isn't it? We use them, we even think in them, but we're more complicated than even the labels themselves imply. I mean, it's not enough sometimes to say that someone is from, say, Nashville, Tennessee, or a military brat. It's not enough to say that someone comes from good people or to identify someone by vocation or, or even occupation. And on that last, what happens when someone retires? Do they suddenly cease to be? Well, of course not. But even our relationship with labels is complicated. And listen, for all of our talk about issuing labels, we embrace them every day on multiple levels and in multiple ways. Whether your clothes, your vehicles, your TV, your food, your baby formula, COVID vaccine, pharmacy, tissues, sports teams, software, smartphone, tractor, pencils, computers, glasses, underwear, toothpaste, toilet bowl, toilet bowl plunger, 
weed killer, bug spray, music styles, Christmas lights, extension cords, vitamin supplements. I mean, everything has a label, a brand. Consider the following in turn. I mean, it's not just what they look like, right? Though it's, it needs to be said, there's an entire industry built up around the psychology of symbols, colors, images. But images are important because of what we associate with them. You know, some years ago, First Union Bank took over Wachovia Bank. The First Union, First Union was a bigger bank with branches spanning several states with a headquarters in Charlotte. But after the takeover... First Union changed their name, logo, everything to Wachovia because they had a better reputation. Thus, brands also indicate values, priorities, grocery stores, car dealerships, gyms, even hospitals all count on our ability to recognize brands and to associate certain things with them. And listen, churches are not immune from this. I mean, whether you're talking about the Roman Catholic Church, Greek Orthodox Church, Lutherans, Baptists, Anabaptists, Primitive Baptists, Methodists, Presbyterian Church of America, the Evangelical Presbyterian Church, the Presbyterian Church USA, which is what we are, so-called Independents, Church of God, Seventh-day Adventists, Pentecostals, United Church of Christ, Disciples of Christ. And listen, y'all, to be clear, that's not even an exhaustive list. Churches have brands too. And these churches, these brands are all largely built upon the idea of association. Which ideas, which theology, with which practices does someone want to be associated? It's one of the reasons why people have, over the years, balked at church leadership and governance because of decisions, missteps whopping abuses of power, and more. You know, Mebane Presbyterian um, on 5th Street left our denomination because of differences that they professed in theology. Mebane First Presbyterian on Holt Street elected elders and deacons just two weeks ago because staying with the denomination was important to them. Being on or off brand marks our associations. But perhaps more importantly... Brands mark ownership. Now, as you may know, cattle, for example, were literally marked with a symbol to show that a particular herd belonged to a particular farm. And it was the emotional and economic equivalent of planting a stake in the ground showing that a plot of land belongs to a particular family. And so the cattle mark doesn't just represent a farm. It represents the family behind that farm. It represents the history of that farmer's dealings with neighbors, with the law, with their, within their own house. The symbol comes to represent more than just where the cow or bull reside. It becomes an impetus for how those of other or like brands should behave. The brand doesn't just mark the cattle. The brand marks the one viewing it also. Okay, well, so what? What does any of that have to do with our passages for this week? Well, God is banking on our complicated relationship with brands, with symbolism, to drive home the need for us to consider our behavior, our demonstrated faithfulness, as a part of God's mark on us. For us as Christians to be on brand, to show that we belong truly to God. So, Let's listen first to Hosea. This is chapter 1, verses 2 through 10. God commands Hosea to marry. Listen for the word of God to us all. When the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to him, Go, marry a prostitute, 
and have children of prostitution. For the land, people of the land commit great prostitution by deserting the Lord. So Hosea went and took Gomer, um, Deblium's um, daughter, and she became pregnant and bore him a son. The Lord said to him, Name him Jezreel, for in a while, a little while, I will punish the house of Jehu for the blood of Jezreel, and I will destroy the kingdom of the house of Israel. On that day I will break the bow of Israel in the Jezreel valley. Gomer became pregnant again and gave birth to a daughter. Then the Lord said to Hosea, Name her no compassion, because I will no longer have compassion on the house of Israel or forgive them. But I will have compassion on the house of Judah. I, the Lord their God, will save them. I will not save them by bow or by sword or by war or by horses or by horsemen. When Gomer finished nursing no compassion, she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. Then the Lord said, Name him, not my people, because you are not my people, and I am not your God. Yet the number of the people of Israel will be like the sand of the sea which can neither be measured nor numbered. And in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, it will be said to them, children of the living God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So this is what can get tricky about reading Hosea. I mean, for the moment, let's set aside questions of Gomer's willingness to be a part of what Hosea is doing, or the children for that matter. But it seems clear every aspect of Hosea's life is devoted to putting forward this message from God about the unfaithfulness of the nation. And we're talking about an expanse of years. And Gomer's status as a prostitute was public knowledge. I mean, seriously, if it wasn't now, throughout history, as long as the book of Hosea is a part of the Bible, That's the label she gets to carry. It doesn't matter how she got there. What in her life may have forced her to make whatever choices she had to make or if she was a slave. God told Hosea to marry a prostitute as a protest against Israel. And so Hosea married Gomer. And look, let's just be real about what this implies. Prostitution was seen as wrong back in Hosea's day though women were yet largely seen as property. But like a field where all the farmers in the area tried to plant at the same time, Gomer would have been seen as unlovable and untouchable and unworkable by anyone with repute. And yet, even in the midst of protest, there is grace. Despite the image her label is meant to convey, Hosea's act of commitment is supposed to speak to God's commitment to all of us. Hosea married Gomer despite her label. God commits to us despite our sins. As for the children, I mean, it's the same thing. Despite having names like Place of the Broken Bow or No Compassion or Not My People. I mean, seriously, can you imagine what middle school must have been like for them? Despite having those labels, Verse 14 says unwaveringly and unequivocally that they will come to be labeled children of the living God. Dude. But it's important to remember that these labels, these brand markings, are not just signs of ownership or distinction. They are signs of behavior. God's behavior. Our behavior. And what God and our behavior is expected to to be. Look, just to drive it home even further, consider Colossians um, chapter 2, verses 6 through 19. Here, Paul writes about the symbolism of life in Christ. Listen further for the word of God to us all. So live in Christ Jesus, the Lord, in the same way as you received him. Be rooted and built up in him. Be established in faith and overflow with thanksgiving, just as you were taught. See to it that nobody enslaves you with philosophy and foolish deception, which conform to human traditions and the way the world thinks and acts rather than Christ. All the fullness of deity lives in Christ's body. And if you have been filled by him, who is the head of every ruler and authority, 
and you have been fulfilled by him who is the head of every ruler and authority. In him you were also circumcised with a circumcision not administered by human hands. The circumcision of Christ is realized in the stripping away of the whole self dominated by sin. You were buried with him through baptism and raised with him through faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead. When you were dead because of the things you had done wrong and because your body wasn't circumcised, God made you alive with Christ and forgave all the things you had done wrong. He destroyed the record of the debt we owed with its requirements that worked against us. He canceled it by nailing it to the cross. When he disarmed the rulers and authorities, he exposed them to public disgrace by leading them on a triumphal parade. So don't let anyone judge you about eating or drinking or about a festival or new moon observance or Sabbaths. These religious practices are only a shadow of what was coming. The body that casts the shadow is Christ. Don't let anyone who wants to practice harsh self-denial and worship angels rob you of the prize. They go into detail about what they've seen in visions and have become unjustifiably arrogant by their selfish way of thinking. They don't stay connected to the head. The head nourishes and supports the whole body through the joints and ligaments, so the body grows with a growth that is from God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So, you know, it's said a lot that Jesus was God on earth, that Jesus represented what it would be like for God to walk among, among us. But the Colossians passage reminds us that Jesus isn't just a brand of God. Verse 9 is specific. All the fullness of deity lives in Christ's body. <clears throat> It wasn't just that Jesus was God-like. And then Paul goes on to make a comparison of that with our other symbols, circumcision, baptism, and other religious rituals and practices. You know, to appreciate the first example, we've got to remember that um, the principal sign of the covenant with God, you know, with Abraham, with humanity, was circumcision. It was a sign of our commitment in the face of God's promises. And Paul writes that our hearts have been circumcised. I mean, that's a recognition that physical signs are fleeting. I mean, for example, if I lose my wedding ring or forget to put it back on after I finish making hamburgers, I won't suddenly cease to be married. But wearing it doesn't make me any more faithful than my heart chooses to be. God empowers us to choose God in more than just a ceremonial manner. Like Hosea, God wants us to commit the whole of our lives, just as God committed God's own life to us. And listen, as for our baptisms and communion, for that matter, so much of what this symbol does and is depends on where our hearts are, where our minds are. I mean, I can preach and read the Bible and pray and attend church and do the mission trips and give every dime I have in my savings and retirement. But if God isn't really a part of my heart and soul, then what do all those things really mean? And I can say, well, this is the body and blood. And I can say, in baptism I die and I am resurrected with Christ. But what good is that if I don't really think so? If my heart doesn't say so? And this is true even for labels, for symbols, for brands that are meaningless. Listen, take a sports team, for example. A team can have a name, a logo, personalities, leadership, bank accounts, history, loyal fans, entire stadiums named after them. And then, for any number of reasons, the team changes their name, changes ownership. Are they really a different team? And does it really matter? Some people think so. Some people will refuse to use the new name or even grieve physically, emotionally, in a real way. Grieve the death of the original team. And yet, there's something a bit different when we're talking about baptism. There's something different when we're talking about God's promises. Because unlike almost everything else in our lives that are dependent upon what we think, what we feel, 
what we give, what we do to give something meaning, God's promises stand alone. God's labels cannot be removed or changed. Cain remains marked by God. Jacob, despite a lifetime of egregious activities, remains the namesake of a nation. King David, despite heinous acts, has the symbol of his rule on Israel's flag to this day. Jesus himself is said to be his descendant. Our baptisms remain even if we don't remember them. And despite a lifetime of sins, hypocrisy, and utter faithlessness, we remain children of the living God, not because of what we've done or the labels we've embraced, but because God actually embraces us. Thus, Paul writes his warnings about getting carried away by rituals. And listen, don't get me wrong. I'm comforted by ritual as much as the next person, maybe more so given my profession. I mean, changing routines, changing rituals can get tiresome, burdensome. Having to constantly manage expectations and anxiety is draining. And we have these rituals for a reason. They didn't just fall out of a tree. And I would argue that one of the most important reasons to hang on to ritual is the connection that they have to our history, to our identity, to how we even came to be. Do I pray before meals because I genuinely thank God for the food? Yes, absolutely. But I also do it because my parents taught me to do that. And praying before meals connects me with them, especially when I wasn't living with them anymore. Circumcision was one of those rituals that did more than mark the men in the religious community as belonging to God, which wasn't a symbol people would necessarily see. But doing so connected people to Abraham, to the Exodus, to the Bible, to the nation, to God. Letting it go was a huge ask. After millennia, of you shall have no other gods before me, to suddenly say that festivals, a new moon observance, or Sabbaths suddenly didn't matter was a huge cultural leap to be asking people to make. But listen, our practices then and now, our actions then and now, should be pointing to Jesus Christ. What we embrace from one generation to the next, what we believe from one historical moment to the next, should be resting on Jesus Christ. We must practice humility before God because we ourselves are not God, only Christ. And as we say famously in our elder training here, there is but one head of this church, Jesus Christ. Not me, not the session, our governing body, not our longtime members, not our new folks, not circumstances, not our budget, not the changing landscape, demographics, or cultural around us. Only Jesus is the head of this body. That makes us a bit more than just symbols. We are a part of what God is up to in this world. Our very lives are meant to be symbols for God's mercies. Our choices are supposed to reflect God's brand on us. The transformations that we experience with God are a sign that the label, children of the living God, fits just fine. Not because we are worthy, but because we are embraced. Not because we're perfect, but because God's love still seeks to perfect us. So my brothers and sisters in Christ, let us work to be on brand and show to whom we belong. In the great name of the one who claims us. Amen.
Giving is a form of gratitude because it shows that we're aware that we've been blessed and that we, that we stand always in God's grace. So let us move beyond obligation or ritual. Let us reflect on what we have given in all our various ways throughout the week, whether online, in person, in kindnesses, in money, in time, with our presence, certainly with our prayers. Let us reflect and then thank God together. still making make your will be done on earth as in heaven but who am i to do this what am i but broken take me as i am to meet you where you are to be what i must be it must bring you anguish the grace you've offered, taken so for granted, used to fill our offers, instead of healing wounds, confronting all our demons, may your will be done, in us as in heaven, but who are you to do this, what are we but what are we broken, but take us as we are. Where you are to be what we must be. A church that's changing lives to the credit of God's glory. That any who may see us will see what you are doing, making me whole, making us whole, making us whole. as we are, to meet you where you are, to be what we must be. Take us as we are, to meet you where you are, to be what we must be. Take us as we are, to meet you where you are.
Let us pray together. God who teaches, take these representatives of our blessing and wealth and make the world around us rich. Take us and make us gifts also, inspiring the transformation you are seeking for our world, yes, but for those right around us as well. Amen. As we pray together, an opportunity will be given in the midst of the prayer for you to lift up private prayers. Let us pray together. The Lord be with you and also with you. Let us pray. Holy God, you have left your mark on this world. The marvel of creation, the power of love, the far reach and healing prowess of forgiveness, examples of nobility and greatness and compassion we find even in the midst of a world like this one. You leave your mark on us. Despite our constant attempts to mar the image of God in us, to do so much to block the view of the humanity you de designed us to be, Thank you, Lord, that what you made us to be remains and ever possible. As much as you give us a chance to transform, help us give that same chance to each other. Teach us to use the labels you place on us instead of the ones that we come up with. When we roll out of bed, get in the car, stand in line at the store, sit in worship, extend our help, extend our reach, look at others, look in a mirror. May we see instead what you see, all our faults, all our possibilities, all the reasons you choose to make salvation possible. Let us really be not just in name, but in actions, in hearts and minds, children of the living God. When confronted with sorrows, imposed and unimaginable, let us be your children. When facing disease in our bodies and our hearts, and or in our hearts, from news, podcasts, viruses, injuries, unresolved histories, constant pressures, or waves of bad circumstances. Let us be your children. When hearing about wars and rumors of wars, when contemplating our responses to violence, when trying to make sense of an economy that doesn't make sense, let us be your children. And by your Spirit, May we be emboldened to share the story of your life with us, how you choose us, how you have changed us, how you have redeemed and remade us. May any who encounter us find a library of stories of your love and mercy in our lives and come away seeing you more clearly. May evangelism truly be a part of our ordinary, everyday lives. And so we pray for so many in our community who are sick, shut in and in rehab and expecting procedures. We pray for those among us who've lost loved ones. We even think of those on our public and private prayer lists. Lord, intervene as only your mercies can. Help us not only reach for your hand, O God, help us be your hands. Hear us now as we pray. Thank you for believing in us. Thank you for transforming us. Thank you for teaching us even how to pray when words fail us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us say together our benediction. The transformations we experience with God are a sign that the label, children of the living God, fits just fine. Not because we're worthy, but because we are embraced. Not because we're perfect, but because God's love still seeks to perfect us. And so get up, take heart, 
Jesus is still calling you. Go, and may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and minds this day and forevermore. Amen. Alle, 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 luya. Alle, 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 luya. Alle, 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 luya. Alle, luya, alle, luya. Alle, 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 luya. Alle, 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 luya. Alle, alle, alle. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah.